This time in the Magic Kitchen, we are joined by Rick DeAmpert, author of Crows and Ravens. I'm Leandra Witchwood. And I'm Elise Wells. And welcome to the Magic Kitchen podcast, where we talk about magic, kitchen witchcraft, herbs, and everything in between. Magic Kitchen podcast is fully and independently funded by the Witchwood Tea House. So show us some support and head over to the witchwoodteahouse.com to purchase some deliciously hand blended loose leaf teas or one of my other botanical products. As a special thank you for your support, please use pod 15 at checkout to take 15% off of your next order. So without any further ado, let's get to the episode. Blessed be. Oh my gosh. So it is October already. Where has this year gone? <laughs> I know. And it's crazy because this interview, you had to miss this one, actually. It's Crows and Ravens yes, with Ritchie Yamper. I did. And um, it, I feel like I recorded it yesterday and it was like right. probably three months, four months, five months. I don't know. I know. Ago. Different lifetime ago. I was ago. flying. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like I, I, I went on a retreat in May and I feel like I haven't. It, like I've been in this vortex of like personal growth and business growth yeah. and oh yeah just yeah like just professional and personal growth for like I don't even know just like in, in hyper so speed much. I feel like in the millennium <laughs> like I'm in the millennium falcon and there's just like light passing <laughs> zoom zoom yeah <laughs> I feel the same way. Oh my gosh! So so rooted rituals just ended. That's my first summit. And yeah, if you missed it, was it, awesome. it was it. Yeah, it was just amazing. Like so many great speakers. And um, don't worry, I'm gonna do another one. I think I don't know when yet. <laughs> I haven't planned it yet. Like it's, there's so much work that goes into it. I was Not gonna just say don't collaborating. Out, time. Oh my gosh! It looks yeah, like I think a I lot might just do. Work. It is. I think I might do two of these a year. And then maybe, I don't know, depending on, on the, uh, the, re the reception of it, then we'll, we'll talk about more, but yeah, definitely two years enough because it's so much work, like so much back end work that nobody sees. And yeah, it's so much, but so the, the, the rooted rituals just came to an end. Um, I, <laughs> We have their ancestor circle coming up. Mm -hmm. It's going to be so On October great. October 19th. Oh. <laughs> I have been so excited, like just putting together the online resources that are received. Mm. In addition, like Leandra and I, of course, I'm as we record this, I'm still in Greece. So we're, yeah. we're planning to get together before the workshop in person and really get the, the groundwork down for what this guided yeah. part is going to look like. Mm -hmm. Um, so on this end, currently, I'm just looking at the online stuff. Like, what's the bonuses that participants yes. get? And yeah. it's just so much. It's so, so nice. And I, I I went live today in the Seekers of the Sacred Wild, my free Facebook group. Mm -hmm. And I always do readings every Wednesday morning. And I was talking with them about it. And I was like, and it just kind of dawned on me. I was like, this is just my MO. Like, my philosophy as a teacher is always that what we do in the container, whether it's a single evening or three months is one thing. But then after that, the support yes. in the resources continues forever. Continues. And that is so yeah. important to me. Like I'll never teach and just leave you hanging at the end. Like you're going to always have something no. you can take with you from the experience. Yeah. And in this case, physically, we'll be making an yeah. ancestor oil together yes. that you can use at home too. And, and, and oils are especially important in my work because of the scent. Like yeah. when I smell something from a, spe a special experience, like this is going to be, mm -hmm. you know, you'll bring that home, you'll anoint yourself, you'll anoint maybe your ancestor altar and the pieces on it. And it's going to put you back there, back with Leon yeah. and I in that sacred circle and help you connect. Absolutely. Deeper. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I think that's one of the, re like these, 
one off events that we do. We have a bunch of them always seems like we always have something going on, Mm -hmm. whether it be in our communities. But I think that's why we created communities online is so that we can offer that additional support so we can stack resources so people can get into it. Um, You know, like this month in the Rebel Mystic community, we are working on petitions. I'm teaching everyone how to do the nitty gritty of, of a petition, how to consecrate, create it and then release it so that it goes to where you intend it to be. And that is it links with these the ancestor circle it leaks with all the other work that we're doing anytime. Um, and actually we'll be talking more about ancestors in our yeah. first ever wheel of the year book club. Leandra and I yes. have begun. Yes. The first meeting is going to be October 28th at mm-hmm. 7 PM EST. And yes. we are going to be discussing ancestral whispers by Ben Stimson. And we had been on the show last season, I believe. Um, yeah, might have even been this year, but around Beltane. If I remember correctly, it was around Beltane. Yeah. Because I remember talking about yeah. how Beltane and Samhain are at opposite ends of mm-hmm. the wheel. And it's beautiful because now we're discussing it on that opposite end of the wheel. Yeah. And when you join the book club, which you can join either through my Patreon community at the Dedicate or Initiate tiers, or through Leandra's Rebel Mystic community, you can join the Magic Kitchen Pantry yeah. directly to get access to this book club. Um, it'll be recorded as well for those who can't participate. It'll be available for members of the pantry again, either on the rebel mystic on circle or through Patreon. And we vote on the books. So this, this book was chosen by the current members, but if it sounds good, you can jump right in and then you'll vote on the next one and it's wheel of the year. (laughs) So there's none of this like, Oh my God, four weeks. I got to read a whole book. Like, nah, we are going to give you six weeks every time to read the book. Yes. Yeah. Which I know, I know sometimes that is good and bad because if you're like me, you wait to the last minute, but. <laughs> well, that's so your doesn't matter. <laughs> you that get, is, it's just. You it's just, have more time. <laughs> you have more time. If you choose to accept it. <laughs> Don't be like Leandra. <laughs> <laughs> Speed reading, you know. <laughs> I mean, sometimes I feel like we are speed reading because we'll have we had this spurt over the summer, which you guys won't notice as listeners because Mm -hmm. the the episodes are going to keep coming out every two weeks. But right. We recorded something like five interviews in four weeks. Yes. Do you remember that? I don't know if it was June. (laughs) Maybe it was April. I don't know. There was a time during. It was recently. Like, yeah, like, like like we were saying, time is flying like it's buzzing by. So I can't keep track of what month is what and what happened when. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but so sometimes we do only have five days or so to read a book. But but mm-hmm. for me, like I will always read the book. Like if we have a guest on the show, it's, yeah. it's going to be because we believe in the words being shared in their yeah. books and by them. Yes. So mm-hmm. it is definitely. Yeah. Yeah. Join us at book club. It's going to be <laughs> awesome. Um And. Another last couple of things. Um, We are in spooky season. It is no surprise. And if you are new to the podcast and you're listening for the first time, welcome to the Magic Kitchen. Welcome. And we both love to teach. We love to share our knowledge. And while I'm in the U.S., I'm going to be doing so many in-person events. But also, (laughs) I will continue my regular pace of online workshops as well. So I have an online workshop on the 24th. That is all about raising energy, how to raise energy, what the heck that means when people talk about it, how to know you've done it successfully when you're in ritual or standing at your altar and you're like, did it work? Am I, am I doing it? We're going to talk through all those, those questions that can be so awkward to ask sometimes. And I will also be teaching, it's called the spiral path because I will be teaching the spiral path, which is my, my personal means of raising energy. Um, that in speaking with other witches over the years, I've, I've realized it is a bit unique. And so it's, but it's very teachable. So I will be guiding you through how to do that online. So if you are not able to join me in Pennsylvania or in Maryland, that workshop is on the 24th of October. And I would love to see you there. It will always be recorded for indefinite access. And then in on the 25th and the 26th of October, I will be in Haverty Grace, Maryland, doing lots of cool things. Now, first of all, Haverty Grace is very worth visiting. If you've never been, it is one of the top 20 cute small towns in America. It's like one of those small towns you wouldn't believe exists because it's actually diverse and it's actually welcoming. 
Like it's like wow. these small towns you watch on movies and TVs and you're always like, oh, but just don't forget, they're probably racist. Like, no, like this right. is actually one of those small towns and movies that you're like, eh, this is real. So it's wonderful. <laughs> and I'll be reading tarot at the Mystic Night Market hosted by Megan Plummer, um, who is my co-host for the Cosmic Theater Mystery School, my paranormal podcast. And I'll be reading tarot at her event on the 25th. And then the 26th, her and I are co-hosting a spirit walk. This is our second annual spirit walk. Our Witch's Guide to Ethical Ghost Hunting, where we guide you through town to some of the haunted places. And we interact not only with the ghosts, but we help you understand how to connect to egregore and land spirits and other spirits of place while we're on that walk. And then we're ending the night with a seance, which there are only two tickets left. So I'm hesitant to even mention it because it's filled up very fast. But come to the spirit walk. It is going to be Really, really lovely. And there's a haunted inn you can stay at if you're not local and you want somewhere to stay. So the Vandiver is right there. Um, so, yeah, I talked to Leandra about that. I was like, I think I want to get a room there just to, like, experience it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, yes. And that's that. That's spooky season. It's flowing. It's happening. Lots of events yeah. on the horizon. It kind of... So that whole area reminds me of the opportunity I had when I was in Reno, Nevada. So there's, I don't remember the name of the hotel, but there's a hotel there that is famously haunted. And Oh, I know this story. Yes. And I was there with the Dragon Ritual drummers and we were drumming in with the spirits and everything like that. And that was the first time I ever experienced somebody actually getting possessed and it was so interesting because, of course, it's not like, you know, pea soup and movie, movie theater type <laughs> things. It was just it was just so interesting and, and watching them handle that and being able to experience like that spiritual essence of of ghost hunting. Quote, I'm using air quotes because it wasn't really ghost hunting. It was mm -hmm. just communing. Exactly. It was very, exactly. very interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that, I'll save it for the Cosmic Theater Mystery School. But if, if you listen to that show, like that's what me and that's what me and Megan are all about. Um, yeah. And Megan and Leandra are friends too. Like it's really nice that yeah. I've been able to kind of grow my own witchy circle in real life as yes. well to include like it. all my all my favorite people. Um, but yeah, her and I—that's what we're dedicated to in that show—is like bridging the gap between the paranormal and the spirit mm -hmm. world in our view as, as witches. So, yeah, yeah. I don't know why that's it. such a mutually exclusive conversation sometimes. <laughs> it really is. It's not something that you usually hear about either. You know, you hear ghost hunting like, oh, ghost adventures or. Yeah, you know. they're like trying to spook <laughs> themselves to spook you yeah. at home. Yeah, it's wild. <laughs> so we're doing it differently. Come out to have a degrees. Meet the land spirits yeah. and ghosts. Why not both? And ghosts. <laughs> why not? Because they're probably the same thing. <laughs> In some cases, they're the same thing. <laughs> That's awesome. Rick D'Ampert is a longtime journalist who spent 23 years as the entertainment writer for the Daytona Beach News Journal. He presents workshops and lectures on metaphysical topics at a variety of pagan festivals in the Southeast and performs music at non-pagan events, including Unitarian Universalist churches. Rick has studied Hindu sacred sound, shamanic drumming, goddess worship, Taoism, and more. His crow art has been displayed publicly around Florida as well. Visit him at rickdeampert.com, and that link is in the show notes as well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for having me, Elise. Any day I get to talk about crows, it's a good day. Oh, yeah. Well, and Leandra is gutted that she's not here because she we got this book box and she literally read it that night. Like she opened it. <laughs> I don't think she even opened the other books yet. She was so excited for this book. Uh, and I want to start with a question that she sent ahead. OK, and it's probably one that listeners have about crows as well. And ravens, if they're lucky to live near ravens. Mm -hmm. How do you begin a relationship with crows that seem afraid to come into your yard? Because her crows, she sees them in the trees, like around the fence, but they don't like her yard. And she doesn't have a dog because I said, do you have a dog? I mean, that would, but there's no one out there. No cats, nothing. Uh, that's, that happened to uh, my editor, Heather Green, uh, during the process. She's my of my editor too. Okay, yeah. So we were emailing that. back and forth, and she's in Atlanta. I'm in uh, East Coast, Florida, here in the U.S. 
And she said, Rick, I hear crows all around, but I, I can't get them to come to the yard. Uh, there's a good chance, uh, and I emailed this to Leandra, uh, there's a good chance that what's happening, not saying exactly, but just a theory, that something happened uh, at that specific location. Not that she, that Leander did it or anything, but as I talk about in the book, crows have these memories. Uh, and that's yeah. been scientifically proven by this uh, wonderful wildlife biologist, John Marsliff, who's like the Mr. Crow guy. I highly recommend his writings, his books. But he conducted experiments in which he proved that crows are able to remember human faces. And so if you're aggressive to crows, they will remember. And if you favor them, they will remember. But it gets even more weird because his experiments proved uh, that crows are able to communicate this to other crows and even to younger generations. So uh, what's going on there uh, could be that there's some distant memory of something happened to the crows. And so they're very skittish and cautious about this locale. And it doesn't mean huh. that who's ever there at that time did something uh, disturbing to the crow population is that they have this memory, which is one of the, the fascinating things about crows that have been, if you go back and, uh, you know, uh, the ravens, of course, ravens and crows, they are different species, but they're part of the family known as corvids. And uh, of course, the Norse mythologies, uh, Odin, the god, has uh, Hujin and Munin, the two crow, uh, two crows, two ravens on his shoulder that go around Midgard, the world, and they come back and report to him. And the ancient Norse dubbed them, those names translate as thought and memory. So even back uh, a millennia, a millennium or more ago, these ancient uh, Norse and probably other cultures recognize that crows and ravens were able to remember, to have these spectacular, visibly palpable uh, memories, however they manifested. So this goes way back. Uh, yeah. So that that could be what's going on. But I, I would say, uh, I, I emailed Leandra, uh, when you said, uh, I got an email from her, uh, the crows that come to my backyard here in Florida, it seems like every spring there's a new crew or tribe. And it, I think it has to do with their mating, seasonal mating or something. But every spring, it seems like there's different crows. How can you tell? They all look alike, Rick. Well, you <laughs> can see their behaviors. Different crows, if you're able to watch them, the same ones, uh, you can see that they have different walks. Uh, some of the crows go to this tree. For a couple of years ago, the crows would get the popcorn I threw out, and they would go to the roof of my home when I finally figured out, where are they going? And <laughs> so anyway, um, but the crows, they're still skittish around me. I'm so jealous of people. People, that's one of the joys since the books come out. Uh, having book signings, meeting people and sharing their crow stories. And people say, oh, my uncle had a crow that would come down and light on his shoulder. And I'm like, what? and yeah. the crows that come by. Yeah. And gifts, they bring, quote unquote, gifts, trinkets or whatever. And the crows that come to me, uh, when I go into the backyard, they'll fly up to the higher branches of the trees mm. and kind of look at me. I'll put out the tortilla chips or crackers or popcorn. And when I come back on my back patio, then they'll fly down. So I'm like, mm. come on, guys, uh, come closer. It's OK. But, yeah. Uh, crows well, and that's, crows. <laughs> exactly. That's what I was going to say is I feel like they're the kind of animals that they they know themselves and they know what they're about. And they're they're going to decide on their terms. Yeah. What's I, going down. I, I, I tell people this and, and I have my wood, my woods, my home backs on woods here. Uh, um, so anyway, there's squirrels that come in my yard daily. So I put popcorn out and, and tortilla chips and the squirrels will come. The crows will come sooner or later. And 
sometimes they're both at the same time. And if you're just watching, you may think, oh, the squirrels are braver because I'll put it out. They'll come running and boom, you know, start munching. And the crows always hang back. But that's because the squirrels are stupider. They're not smart yeah. enough to realize that if there's a human nearby, it could be a threat. The crows know this. So it's like, oh, the squirrels are so brave. No, they're just not cognizant of the dangers uh, of living in the proximity of humankind. So mm. it's that so commentary on, uh, is it courage yeah. or <laughs> stupidity? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. And I think we humans display that trait sometimes. It's like, wow, is that guy brave or is yeah. he just crazy <laughs> stupid? So, so yeah. <laughs> uh. The ritual is going well. The candle took flame at exactly the right moment. You said all the words perfectly and you've placed your offerings on the altar. But nothing's happening. Or is it? How do you know it's working? What am I supposed to feel? The most important part of magic is raising energy, and yet it's not always clear how to do it, or even what it is. If raising energy intimidates, confuses, or even scares you, but you know you want to do it right, join me October 24th for The Spiral Path. I'll be teaching my own preferred method of raising energy, The Spiral Path, as well as walking you through the other types of energy you can raise. If you are ready to build trust with energy, this workshop is for you. Get your tickets at seekingnumina.com slash events or by following the link in the show notes. So I wanted to ask about, because you have had the blessing to get to know two pro tribes in your time, at least in the book, maybe yeah. more, um, yeah. but you had to move. And I think that's one of the saddest things is like, for most of us, you know, we, we don't own our homes and we don't have our own land. And so we don't really have ownership over those relationships like we might want. So how, what would be your advice if somebody wants to have a relationship with crows, but is afraid that when they move, something bad could happen to the, to the crows, or maybe they're just afraid that that'll be a one-time thing and they won't be able to do it in another, in another house. I, I've, uh, I moved when I moved and it was in the middle of this book and, and um, uh, I'll share this, and this did not make it into the book, but about, uh, and I literally moved three miles down the road here in Palm Coast, Florida. So I was blessed to find another place that backed up to woods. That's very important for me. Uh, but about six, six months before I had to move, uh, I looked out on my backyard in my old place, which backed to woods, and I saw a crow hanging upside down on a branch. I'm like, what? I went to get my camera. I'm just like, blah, 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 blah. And anyway, before I could get my camera ready, the crow was gone. And at first I thought, did I hallucinate this? Did I dream this? <laughs> and then a uh, couple of months later, it's like, well, I, th I think I saw it anyway. Um, but I read in some other uh, pro nat naturalist books that other people have witnessed this too. I immediately thought about the hanged man of tarot when I saw the crow yeah. hanging upside down, which is not necessarily a card of of uh, bad omen. But I just thought, but it wasn't until years, it's like, oh, that was a sign that I'm going, you know, I, in hindsight, I can see that was a sign because yeah. I, I, I literally lost a year of writing the book. Uh, it, it interrupted it. Uh, wow. But anyway, when I moved to my new place, I was like, are the, oh, I wish the crows would follow me. And on my, literally on my first moving van trip to the new place, I heard crows calling like, oh, okay. And I don't think it was my crow tribe from my other place, but it was a reminder that if you want to look at it in practical terms, crows are ubiquitous they're everywhere if you live in an if you live in the heart of new york city or new orleans or uh or, or athens uh or london or wherever if you think oh okay i'm not going to have any opportunity to connect with crows do crow magic 
They're on every continent, crows and ravens, uh, except Antarctica. And they're very urban. Crows are more what I call human gregarious. So mm, I love when that I term. had that. Well, thank you. Uh, yeah, that that's my term. Uh, ravens are, from what I've read, are a little more skittish. Ravens are not in Florida. I grew up in northern New Mexico uh, in the 60s. So I, I probably, as a child, saw ravens. Uh, but then, you know, they were just blackbirds. Oh, so I don't have any memories. So I I speak about crows because just never encountered ravens here in Florida, but um, they're um, they're they're going to be around us. And for me, and this is one of the themes that runs through my book, is they are a unique opportunity to form communion with Gaia, the Earth Goddess. However, you define whether you define that spiritually or even just in a naturalist sense. Yeah. They're going to be, I, I see crows every time I go to my Target shopping center five uh, five miles away. They're up on the lot, lamp post and I take, sometimes I take my camera and take photos uh, of them. So they're everywhere. And if you do happen to move and it's like, oh, well, I'm not gonna see crows anymore. You probably are. And given that crows can communicate, uh, when I moved, uh, communicate with each other, when I moved, it was three miles. So my girlfriend, Michelle, who's a psychic intuitive witch, she says, I, I think your uh, previous crow tribe uh, has been in communication with this crow tribe and i said that's what i was thinking too the grapevine <laughs> yeah yeah i i think so and and when michelle comes over she says um uh she she lives down in daytona beach shore she will say um oh the crows know when i arrive when i get out of the car i hear them caw they're 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 saying hello to me and and i absolutely believe that so yeah, yeah. the crow grapevine uh it is a thing is yeah. a thing uh and that's what i love about i mentioned the wildlife biologist john marsliff and i and i tried to do this in the book so there is science in the book uh i have uh uh i my spiritual path is pagan is how i self identify so i have on one side of my, I call this my rat prag brain, my rational pragmatic brain. And over here is my misty into my mystical intuitive brain. And they're constantly <laughs> it's such a like good, it. Yeah. Yeah. Because I we agree here. Like me and Leandra talk about that all the time. Like there's a healthy skepticism that we have to bring to anything we read, learn, are taught, experience, absolutely. personal gnosis, whatever it is. And science actually more often than not seems to support the the mist in, misty into <laughs> right. I, you're i i think you're exactly right and uh and and i uh and and other pro uh books uh that come from a naturalist or a nature biology kind of a national geographic slant they they will some of them will tippy toe up to the spiritual woo woo supernatural aspects some of them are more revelatory, but I, I love seeing that intersection because um, uh, when I started the book, I wanted to see when was the first time humankind noticed crows or ravens. And I didn't know it until I started researching the book, but it goes all the way back to those cave paintings in Lascaux, France, which were discovered in the 19. 40s or 50s but they they date back to 8 18,000 BC and there's uh, and I go over this in the book there's this cave yeah. painting of this bird-headed shaman and I and others say oh it's 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 a crow or a raven it's got to be because mm -hmm. that would have those birds were there uh, then and they would have stood out just like they did to the ancient Norse the Celtic, Irish, uh, uh, just all these cultures. So yeah. they've been impacting our spiritual uh, impulse for as long as, you know, as long as we have evidence of humans 
yeah. on this planet, you know, palpable evidence. So for me, having that scientific uh, basis uh, for me really adds a lot. I, I We don't need to make up the woo woo. The, the basis is right there in front of us. So I'm kind of amazed if if people were to say, oh, uh, there, there's no pro magic there. It's like, well, just watch them for a while. And I'm not saying you have to convert to pagan paganism or witchiness, but watch them. And if you see their behaviors, you're going to kind of get freaked out. You're going to get yeah. freaked out. So. Yeah. And you want them on your side. That's always been my impression of, of the crows is because yeah. I also have never lived near ravens, but with crows, like they really are like in my work with land spirits, I consider the animals of that space, the wild animals to be, I use the term emissaries, emissaries of the land. I like that. Vocal, you know, they're, they can be sent in on behalf. Like I noticed when I do ritual at land on land um, to connect with a specific land and the spirits there. Usually, if it all goes well, they will send an animal to let me know that. And sometimes it's like major, like eye contact with a fox that approaches, and I'm like, "There's no rabies in Greece. It's okay. It's all well, this is normal." Like sometimes it's very direct. Other times yeah. it's birds, and the and the birds are the sound of the land for me, and for I many, like that. I think, because yeah. they we can tell the tone of how the land's feeling from the the birds. They 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 sound the alarm. Or they sound yeah. the welcome horn. Well, and on a tangent of that, uh, crows, uh, again, I, I, I speak mostly of crows because that's my direct experience. But their vocabulary is amazing. And, and I touch on this in the book. Yeah, that was uh, one of my favorite, like, jaw-dropping things to learn about was how vocal and, how and diverse their vocabulary is. Yes, and, and so many times... Uh, as I as I recount, I've been tricked. Uh, it's like uh, I I write about this. I I thought it was a cat trapped up, a kitten up in a tree and afraid to come down. It's like <laughs> oh, I'm gonna have to call the fire department, like in the cartoons, to yeah. come run the ladder up. And then after watching for listening for about five minutes, I finally saw it's a crow that was way up in this tree going, Row! and I was like. And I hear the kitty cat call sometimes here in my backyard only once um, in my 15, 10, 15, well, 15 years or so of, of watching crows closely. Have I heard that kitty cat sound while a crow is flying? And that happened at the Florida Pagan Gathering uh, this past spring around Beltane. So if you if you encounter crows on a regular basis and you take note of their vocalizations, you will be able to begin to see uh, most mornings here. Uh, there's a rooster that lives across the flatwoods, like three miles away. But most mornings, it's the crows who wake me up, usually with three or five, ka 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 or ka 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 ka. And so if you if you pay attention, you'll start to see different um, e even the stereotypical caw. They they say that in so many different ways with different emphasis. And you can kind of get a feel for what what does this call mean? What is this? Uh, and, and which I just find fascinating. Their vocabulary is huge. The ancients noticed that. And use that as a uh, spark for their divin divination systems. Uh, the ancient Celts and and the ancient uh, people of what is modern day Tibet, which just kind of blows my mind. Uh, yeah, that surprised me in the book. I wasn't sure. I I just hadn't. I'll be honest. It's not an area I've studied too often. I I, and, I had not come across that, and I was like, what? Um, so and, and it's there, you know, like so many of these things, uh, there's there's resources. There's a great uh, website called archive.org, O-R-G, and they have all these old journal. I mean, more than 100 years old. They have all these journals from the 1880s uh, and 90, 1890s in Ireland and Great Britain that these scholars back then were uh, there was the Celtic revival going on in Ireland at the time. So they were really getting into the, the history of that, their land, 
their country. And so there's just, oh, there's just so much. We're blessed yeah. to have access to these writings. So, uh, so yeah. Hey there, witches. Did you know that there's an entire community out there dedicated to you and your journey? The Rebel Mystic community is a space where I offer my decades of knowledge and experience to witches just like you. I do this through live events, monthly mentoring, monthly rituals, a book club, and other resources like workbook pages and meditations. There is even a complete self-paced course library you can access. Check the link in the show notes to learn more about this community and how to become a member. Blessed be. Let's actually talk a bit more about the Celtic view of ravens sure. and crows. Um, this this could be a long section, actually, <laughs> because there's a <laughs> lot of questions about it. Um, I guess first, let's talk about raven goddesses, because that term just it was exciting to come across. Yeah, it's it's so fascinating uh, for me for various reasons. And uh like a lot of ancient mythology, there's different sources uh, that began as oral traditions. So sometimes you'll see contradictory um, um, stories that will kind of contradict each other. But uh, most of these stories go back uh, more than a thousand years in Ireland. And uh, and there there's actually three or four there's the morgan there's maca m-a-c-h-a there's neiman if i'm probably not pronouncing that so it's kind of a celtic triple goddess of these goddesses who shape shift into ravens or crows the scholars that i've read differ you know that they don't seem uh the ancients didn't really did they? Uh, is this a crow or raven? It seems to be both in different sources. But what I found really intriguing about the Morgan is uh, and her relationship with Cuchulain, the national ancient warrior, mythological hero of ancient Ireland. If if you read the tales, it's it's like a modern day dysfunctional rom com because <laughs> she she kind of tries to seduce Cuchulain. Uh, she, he rebuffs him, her because she, he's about to go into battle. Uh, some of the, the tribes, ancient, the warring tribes of ancient Ireland in one source, uh, it's translated. Cahalan says, I don't have time for women's behinds. And it's like, <laughs> who translated that? Yeah. It's like, hmm, okay. Uh, it's kind of very overtly sexual. Other sources are less sexual. And then she starts trying to get her revenge on him. She shapeshifts into uh, uh, an eel or uh, what else? Uh, a red-eared, uh, well, and into a, a raven and crow. So then she tries to kill him. And then later in the sagas, uh, she tries to prevent. She's had a vision of his death, though she tries to prevent him going into battle. And so it's this great jumble i guess kind of like modern love where it's like whoa yeah. <laughs> i hate you i love you i hate you anyway so there's all these tales that don't flow together exactly seamlessly but they're just so fascinating and the ancient celtic battle goddesses uh whether it's the maca or the morgan or uh, the other one n-e-m-a-i-n oh yeah and uh, they, they, in some of the tales, they just seem to thrive on creating chaos. They will strike terror into one of the warring tribes, and then they'll go over to the other. It's not like they're choosing one side to win. It's just like they want to see carnage, which is, yeah. of course, very, very dark. But, uh, but I think one of the lessons to be drawn from those ancient tales is that in those times, it, it's a recognition that life in those times where they were, the cultures were literally um, often fighting for resources. Uh, like if the yeah. tribe five hills over had a lot of cattle, 
and you're starving, you're going to go march over there and try and steal some of their cattle. Uh, so it's these tales are just kind of record. You know, it's not like Arnold Schwarzenegger and the Terminator, that kind of thing. But there there were reasons in history of why these uh, frictions and battles happened. And this is personification of it. Or maybe I, I say that, and even as I say that, one of the uh, most curious references uh, in a historian, uh, and, and I forgot the historian's name. I mentioned it in the book. But he says, the last time the Morgan was sighted in Ireland was at uh, the Battle of Maitreya. I'm probably mispronouncing it, like in 1050 AD. Don't don't quote my specifics on that. But I love that's that. It's quite late, his... though. If it's if it's after yeah. 700, I mean, in general, that's pretty well, exactly. late. Exactly. And, yeah. and the, what I like the way this one historian wrote it, he didn't say alleged sighting. He didn't say uh, mythological. He wrote it as if it was factual. And I just thought <laughs> that's very intriguing that I don't know what his spiritual path is or whatever, but he seemed like the people of Ireland that it was just a given that this was true, that it wasn't yeah. a hallucination, a myth, a personification of the horrors of battle. Uh, it was that there was a raven or crow uh, shape-shifting goddess that was encountered on the battlefield. And so it's like, whoa. So there you yeah. go. Yeah. yeah. And that brings me to another question or topic, really. Yeah. Tricksters. Tricksters are applied like the energy of a trickster can be applied to a spirit in your house, like a poltergeist, or it can be applied to a goddess or a god. More so it seems to be gods. But people are very leery of them. You know, Loki is a famous trickster god, Hermes is a famous trickster god. Um, and ravens and crows sort of have that same trickster energy. And even as you were talking about the Morgan and, and her presence on the battlefield, flitting between the tribes, it sort of has that same connotation. Oh, a a absolutely. Absolutely. It's like, what is she up to? Uh, and, um, it, yeah. And, uh, in my, in my book, I cover, uh, uh, there's a significant section on uh, Raven, who is a trickster figure uh, among the Pacific Northwest Coast uh, indigenous tribes uh, in the U.S. But I, I found it very interesting. Uh, and I there is some ancient Hebrew writings, not in the uh, Christian Old Testament, but uh, but these writings came later, like around 500 or 600 A.D. Anyway, they've been translated. Um, but there's a tales where Noah, uh, the dude with the ark, uh, is all the animals are on the ark and he implores Raven. Raven has human consciousness and can talk, which is weird enough <laughs> that among the animals he, he can talk. And Raven says, uh, I mean, Noah says, Raven go see if you can find dry land. And Raven gets an attitude and says, what? You're just trying to get rid of me so that you can get with my wife and, and sexually. <laughs> your love. And I had to read that passage over like five times. Am I reading this correctly? This is an ancient <laughs> rabbinic writing from like 1500 years ago that was translated by uh, a rabbi like in the 18 no 1920s and i just what and then when i started reading more of the raven tales of the pacific northwest people it's amazing cross culture thousands of years how the characteristics of raven very are very much like this uh ancient hebrew jewish encounter uh with raven they it's it's like whoa! This kind of shows the universality of yeah. Raven's trickster aspects, and uh, and the, the Raven tells uh, he's he's kind of 
he's self-satisfying. He's mischievous. He he can be cruel. There's Raven tales where Raven encounters bears and he turns the bears inside out. And yeah, that in the book I was like, wait, what? I gotta go back for that. I but know <laughs> he's that's Raven what he did. is. Yeah, Raven is not a nice guy all the time, but he's <laughs> also bungling. And uh, you know, there's the the Haida tribe, H A I D A. There's a famous tale uh, about how Raven brought light into the world. Uh, the sh- short version is he stole light uh, from humans. And he was carrying it away. And then Eagle saw him and said, what are you doing? I want that. Anyway, so Eagle frightened Raven and he dropped the sun and the moon and the stars. And the tale is more involved than that. Um, Shameless self-promotion. If you if you get my book, you can read more about it anyway. Yeah. (laughs) But so Raven is looking to satisfy his own power and lust for power. He ends up bungling it. And because of that, we humans have sun, moon, stars and light in the world. So he wasn't trying. But there are other tales where he is a benefactor of humans. But in this in this tale, he was looking out for himself. He messed up the heist, but we benefit. And and I think there's just a very basic but noteworthy lesson in there. You've probably heard we've heard that phrase. Uh, when bad things happen to good people, well, sometimes good things happen to people that we can't really explain. And so this is kind of a recognition that sometimes the ways of nature, uh, the earth, uh, however, whatever cosmology or God or goddess you believe in, sometimes things happen that are wonderful. And here's here's Raven. Uh, this Raven tale kind of demonstrates that yeah. um is that sometimes uh that you know that storm you see coming maybe it's a very disruptive storm but it may be the bring the rain that waters your crops and you're going to have food in the coming season so ravens that way uh, uh as as a trickster and and that that applies to other tricksters from what i've read they can be self-serving they can be mm, but they can also be benefactors. I mean, Prometheus stole fire from the Olymp- That's Olympians. Exactly. That's what I was and, thinking about. Yeah. So That's, yay, Prometheus. <laughs> yeah. It's so interesting, too, because I never thought of Prometheus as a trickster energy. But now we're having this conversation. Maybe that's a good word for him because... Um, I've shared about this. I know we were talking about it before recording, but I've shared about it too on Instagram and in my articles with the Wild Hunt about Mediterranean 2024, which was this conference hosted by Roman polytheists from Italy and Greek polytheists from Hellenic polytheists from Greece. And they gave presentations. Individuals from those groups gave presentations. And one of the Greeks gave a talk on Prometheus, actually making him out to be the villain, like a trickster. Wow. Yeah, because okay. he said the fire that he stole was technology and yeah. Zeus was meeting it out, M E T I N G, like, yeah. you know, giving yeah. it out yeah. little by little. And he was deciding when humans were ready for what. And Prometheus ah. jumped the gun for them. Interesting. For, you know, why is then the question if that's the case. So, and it makes you think of this trickster energy. And then it makes me think too of like Loki when. In that story um uh, where he steals hair from Thor's wife, what's her name? And he like shaves her head and steals her hair. Yeah. And then he cut Thor tries to get it back. And so he turns into a salmon, then he turns into this, then he turns into that. And and so then I think they catch him eventually as salmon. And then it leads to Ragnarok. Like it causes quite a lot of trouble. <laughs> so yeah, there there is such an interesting element of of theft and intention and things happening the way they're supposed to anyway yeah yeah and and there's um uh, and and the raven tales like like other myths there's there's such um there's rec- recognition of human nature uh and you think about oh uh, i mean we should know it should be a given that the ancients were much more intelligent than we may I, I mean, I grew up in northern New Mexico, literally uh, three mi- three miles from where Oppenheimer developed the atomic bomb. 
in oh, Los Alamos. That's chilling. Yeah, and and it was so weird growing up there because uh, literally my family lived three miles from the line. This is in the '60s, and then you drive uh, Los Alamos, you drive down the mountain, and you're in Bandelier, where the ancient Pueblo people, where their ruins mm. are. I mean, they used to be called the Anasazi. That name's not favored anymore, for good reason. Uh, so you have this modern technology happening, and then there's this ancient. Uh, land and ruins but if you go down into bandolier in the canyon uh, there's caves literally caves that have been adapted where they live and it's like then you start reading and seeing and it's like oh by living in here in the summer the way the sun shines they -hmm. would be in shade and in winter by having these places as their home the the change of the seasons the sun would be shining more directly and they would be warmer simple thing but it's like oh they were in tune with the land they had the knowledge of the land they were they had knowledge that you know you throw me out in the woods today i i don't know how long i could survive uh so there's just this this earth knowledge earth energy uh that uh, and and these trickster tales, a lot of times, uh, seem to revolve around that. And re- and the ancients who told these tales, they they had deep meaning. Sometimes I guess they were entertaining stories, uh, but it seemed like a lot of times they conveyed knowledge, empathy, hope, that kind of yeah. thing. Yeah, so. yeah. I think it's both. I think I like I think of uh, I always say his name wrong, Huhulin, I think. Uh, I- that sounds, yeah. that sounds good. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> he uh, reminds me of like, like he's like Irish Hercules, you know, like, yeah. And, and Hercules is wildly entertaining. Every one of his labors is like, you know, a plot twist and yeah. the whole, the whole theme. And then the end, and you're like, oh, he did what? And oh, poor guy. And oh, but it also was, was messages. Like the older I get and the more, because growing up Greek, like, even though I didn't live in Greece all my life, we always visited and Hercules is just he's a hero to every kid. Like I was really hard, like it warmed my heart because I saw they're, they're doing a play about Hercules labors for young kids here oh, all summer. Nice. It's like a big advertised. Event. I want to go. You know, it's so good. <laughs> like they really keep him alive. Like it's the, uh-huh. the mythology is seen as, as false, unfortunately here, but it is seen as fun and entertaining, but yeah. they also are incredible lessons. You know, every labor yeah. of Hercules has has a, a moral to it or an understanding to it or or I do think like especially for the ancients, mythology was a way to to give comfort when certain things were inevitable. Like, you know, and, and and I think uh, and in fact, uh, when I was presented a talk this past uh, Sunday at a local Unitarian Universalist church on tricksters, which I mentioned to you <laughs> earlier. I just love I, the I, synchronicity of that. <laughs> yeah. And, but uh, it occurred to me and not for the first time, but that uh, these tales, these myths, uh, sometimes they have really teaching lessons and wisdom but sometimes there, I think their purpose is just to be comforting. It's like they're a recognition that things happen and that uh, others beside me have recognized that life can be hard or challenging or difficult and that there are, uh, you know, there's sunshine that comes out after the flood. So I I like that word comforting. Sometimes they're just comforting, even if they're talking about adversity. uh, That means that somebody survived to tell the tale. Exactly. It's not so you're not so alone in anything. Exactly. Exactly. And so I've I've become more aware just of that function of myth and uh, ancient tales, uh, which, you know, I should have learned that lesson long ago. But anyway, it's never too you're never too old to learn and get something new so there you go yeah. and i also just to add to that i also empower people if they find that same comfort from fiction that's that's so valid it's just as valid as the ancients in their mythology like lord of the rings is that for me that was my gateway okay. into paganism was lord okay. of the rings as yeah. a kid 
and the animism of it and and the Ents marching on Isengard and it was so inspiring. And and when you were speaking, it made me I heard Gandalf in my head when Frodo says, I wish it need not have happened in my time. And Gandalf says, so do all who live to see such times, but it's not for them to decide. All we have is to decide what to do with the time that is given us. I I love that. I, I love that. And that reminds me in talking with my friends, uh, I, I if we look at the long arc of history, um, you know, as George Harrison, the Beatles sang, and mm-hmm. it wasn't his wisdom uh, originated, but all things must pass and cycles and Yeats, the Irish poet, talked about the winding oh, yeah. gyre of history. Um, but on a tangent of all that, I, I read this piece, uh, I think it was on the Wild Hunt website but the right and i can't remember her name but she was talking about on her altar how there's these and whatever path or pass these you know the ancient gods and goddesses she said but on my altar there's also room for pop culture Mm. icons and figurines and stuff that she feels a connection to and i absolutely love that because I, I I'm the same way. My my altar, while my altar has images of Cronunos and uh, crows, of course, uh, and stones that I got when I went to Ireland and from Queen Maeve's. There, that's a whole nother story. I'll have to tell some other time. But anyway, but around my house, uh, you know, there's there's just little figurines of. I got a Lego Robin Hood. The Robin Hood myth is very yes. special to me. Me and too. So, me too. When I found this little that my girlfriend Michelle bought me, it's like, oh, I just love that. So it's got an honored place. Uh, so I, I think, you know, and of course, the Marvel universe with Thor and Loki and the gods. So there's all these ways that uh, that they are manifesting yes. in our current time, and so. Sometimes they're hiding in plain sight. When I when I did a talk on tricksters, this is before your time, but when I did my talk on tricksters, I included Bugs Bunny, uh, the yes. cartoon oh. character. You know what though? I grew up with so much so much Bugs Bunny because we didn't speak Greek growing up, and we would put on Looney Tunes because even if they weren't in English, they were either enough. <laughs> in it, it, you know, we, you just didn't need English. So Bugs Bunny is very dear to my heart. <laughs> yeah, and he's just. When I was creating this lecture and uh, it's like, wow, I, I wanted to have something that people could connect with uh, outside of traditional myth. And it's like uh, bugs, of course. Oh, I mean, spot on. he's just he's the archetypal trickster. He's mischievous. He uh, he can get kind of kinky when he dresses up yes. as, a, as, <laughs> as a female. Yeah. Uh, when when Elmer Fudd's hunting him and. He'll put his fingers in the rifle and it'll just blow Elmer's <laughs> face into a black. And it's like, so he's causing harm, you know, which trickers sometimes they'll, their actions will, are not always nice, but anyway, so. Oh, that's so, yeah. so good. Yeah. I actually appreciate that. Cause I think trickster energy is hard for people to picture because they think it's threatening. Like Loki, people are like, well, how could anybody work with Loki as a god? That's so dangerous. You're letting that energy into your house. But Bugs Bunny, that's from now on, that's going to be how I, <laughs> that's the gateway to trickster energy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And don't forget Raven, I, you know, and uh, and yeah. also I grew, I grew up in the Southwest. So I, I, I have a coyote pelt uh, that I felt, I bought it at a Florida pagan gathering 15, 18 years ago. And the vendor uh was uh vending animal bones and skins and after talking to him i very much felt that he was ethical yeah and was doing it with purpose it was not a money making thing anyway and he told me that he said this animal this coyote pelt he said there's tribes in the midwest there's this program where they have the right to harvest roadkill he said uh this coyote was roadkill and that just mm touch touch me it's like i'm going yeah. to give this creature a hallowed place in my home i wish it was were still alive and running free 
but it's come across my path and I'm going to honor its spirit. And Coyote is a trickster. And I see coyotes around here in East Central Florida. They're, they're oh, urban. Really? Yeah. Oh, they're, oh, wow. um, you know, it's not that I see one a week, but every two or three months when I'm driving back home, uh, they, they're in urban neighborhoods and they're survivors. So that trickster energy and, um, uh, Oh, I'll give you a, a, another uh, instance. I took um, in my book, I talk about the difference between ravens and crows. Well, I was visiting my grandkids in Tampa, Florida. Uh, this was years back. And I took photos of this crow on a wire. And then later I looked at, you know, the digital images on my digital camera. And ravens, one of their characteristics is they have shaggy throat feathers. And it's like, well, I read Audubon said there's no ravens in Florida, but this bird had very shaggy throat feathers. And it's like, mm. could that be a raven? I don't think it was because ravens are considerably larger and they have a different uh, call. Um, but I don't know for just for, I, I still even now look back and wonder if uh, Raven the trickster showed up. And yeah. just for a little bit, because it sure looks like a raven, uh, this photo. And and I turned it into one of my artworks, uh, Mr. Crow artwork. So I take photos and then I digitally woo-woo them. I don't use AI. And then I print them on canvas and sell them to whoever. So, oh, that's awesome. So, yeah, Ra Raven, um, he's not here in Florida, but yet his spirit... His spirit is here in Florida. You may have noticed that here at the Magic Kitchen Podcast, we don't have sponsored ads. That's because this is a fully listener-supported show. We do what we do for you, dear listener, and when you join my Magical Living community on Patreon, you're supporting all the time and energy that goes into setting up podcast interviews, writing articles and rituals, my paranormal mystery novel, and all that I do. If you love this podcast, consider joining my magical space. I can't wait to meet you and be an even bigger part of your magical journey. Go to patreon.com slash Elise Wells or follow the link in the show notes. So I have one last question, if you've got time. Uh I do. I do. And it's a bit of a shift in gears, but this episode is going to release around Samhain. And uh -huh. crows and ravens are seen sort of as death omens, particularly yeah. in the Celtic Irish cultures. And yeah. I'm thinking, too, in the positive side, how and I don't know if you I don't know. Do you have any ideas for how we could work with crow for ancestor connection? I. The short answer is yes. And and I think when I was writing the book and, and I'm reading other writers who have written about crows and ravens, and I had this reaction, uh, it was kind of split almost 50-50. People like, were like, oh, you're writing a book on crows and ravens. That's so cool. And other people were creeped out. They were creeped out. Really? It's like, ooh, I don't know that I like crows. And, uh, you know, one woman told me, she said, I saw a crow take down a baby dove. And it's like, yeah, it's that Disney circle of life thing. Uh, yeah. They will eat smaller birds. Hawks will prey on crows and uh, crow it's nest. It's okay. exactly. And I and I think that's the lesson. And um, and also and I relate this in the book. Um and I've had other friends, pagan and non-pagan, uh, who have had crow encounters that seem to uh, um, prophesy certain events in their life. And they recognize, and I re and, and in their telling, um, it's not that they're, in my experience and talking, it's not that they're conveying bad omens they're conveying omens of change and transition which mm. happens in life um so i i i'm not 
detailing something specific here, but I, I would say uh, if you have a strange encounter with a crow or raven, uh, it doesn't mean death is coming. Uh, I, I took it as, I take it as there's just as a reminder more than a prophecy that life is constantly in flux. Uh, mm -hmm. The only constant is change. And that's something, you know, that old, uh, I guess it's carpe, carpe diem. Is that a Greek phrase? Uh, seize the Latin, day. Latin, yeah. Seize the Latin, day. Latin, mm -hmm. yeah. And so that's how I see a, a number of people over the past three months. They said, I was driving along and a crow flew right in front of my windshield. It's, it's kind of eerie how often that's happened in recent months. Um, so does that have a specific portent? Uh, I don't know. Those people would have to answer that. So um, I, I welcome any visits by by Crow. I hope when I go back out to the to the West again, I feel certain that I'm going to see ravens. Um, and this is in the book, too. Crows and ravens also have this wonderful sense of play. The Internet is filled with YouTube videos of a crow walking behind a cat or dog and poking them in the tail and then hopping back and then they'll do it again. So keep that, I would say for your listeners, keep that in mind for every quote unquote ominous and notice the quote marks encounter. These are also birds who have a sense of play. They're, they're intelligent. So they're kind of like us people, you know, we're not totally <laughs> nice all the time and sometimes we have to do what needs to be done but that's life so if you yeah. have an encounters like oh i frankly i don't believe that a crow or raven encounter signifies death even though yeah. different folk tales uh will say the number of crows in fact mm -hmm. the latest one i read um i think it was one crow according to one tradition is a death omen but i have crows um you know one crow will come by all the time and i'll try and keep this brief but i mentioned this in the book i i had a dream that i saw um the washer at the ford which in which in irish mythology is is a death omen the ancient warriors in uh ancient ireland if they had this vision of the wash, a uh, black cloaked woman, sometimes beautiful, sometimes a hag, washing bloody clothes in a river, then that meant the warrior who saw this is going to die. Well, I had a dream about that. Woke up, I was like, "Whoa, okay." My Irish is heritage uh, heritage is Irish and French, and I thought, "Okay," um, didn't freak me out, and so. Uh, I uh, looked, did some reading on the Morgan and the Washer at the Ford. Those myths are sometimes conflated. Um, and then a few months after that, I was asked to officiate at a friend's wedding here in Central Florida. So I went to the wedding site, which was kind of near Woods. And when I was researching the Morgan, I found this beautiful art image. I wish I could remember the uh, pagan artist name, but it's of the Morgan standing at the edge of a body of water, and there's these crows circling above her, just dozens and dozens of crows, very striking. Well, when I went to this friend's wedding, I took a walk before the wedding down by this pond, and I saw the most crows I've ever seen wow. in one place, and it looked very, very much like this painting. I had seen. I'm like, holy crap, here's another visitation by the Morgan slash the yeah. washer at the Ford. And I was like, okay, death omen. And, you know, that was five years ago. So I'm still here. But like a number of friends have said, it could have been a metaphorical death or transition. Yeah. You know, that was in, my, in the, when I was reading it in the book, I was like, thinking that's where you were going to go with it because I've found in modern times, usually a death omen feels more personal. They like, I find our guides choose something very specifically personal to us that we would expect to see as a death yeah. omen. But that sort of traditional symbolism would to me mean that there's a spiritual 
like a you know the the deaths that we go through when we create yeah you know death and creation just two sides of one coin and and i think also uh when a lot of these myths or folk tales or folk knowledge took root you know hundreds of years ago and life was more precarious you know 300 years ago or in appalachia uh Mm. in the u.s in the 1800s where you know young children there's no health care to speak of so their chances are that most families may have had an infant die tragically so yeah. when a lot of these took root life was more precarious mm-hmm. <clears throat> and you know these days of course life is still precarious and precious but uh it's easier if we put ourselves in the context of the past it's easy to see how people could connect more of omens and portent and how they seemingly or perhaps did manifest in the real world but you know these days uh you know if i need food i go to the grocery store if the storm comes i close my windows so we're less vulnerable to the caprice of life but it can still happen so anyway i'm Mm -hmm. wondering but so (laughs) i i would say to to listeners if you have a eerie encounter with crows or ravens, a crow or a raven, uh, don't freak out. Uh, there's there's just as many folk tales and myths where a crow or raven has shown up and been a benefactor. Uh, mm-hmm. I mean the the and personal accounts of people I've talked to, my fellow pagans and others. So there's just as many accounts where it's a sign of something. I even hate to use the dichotomy of negative and positive. I don't don't think life is. They're they're guardians. I find like, so they're, they're, they like to show themselves. Like for me, my best encounter ever with a crow. And I've shared this on the podcast before. So I apologize to those who've heard of listening, but I was at uh, the Cliffs of Moher in Ireland. And there's a Bridget's well nearby. And I was, my plan was to call an Uber or a taxi and go to the well, but there was none available. No. And I asked all the shopkeeps there because the Cliffs of Moher have a few local shops and no one was particularly helpful. Then I go to the last shop and she was selling this really special jewelry. It like she, you walked in and the energy was good. She had incense burning. Like she wasn't an overt pagan, but she was definitely there for the right reasons, you know? Yeah. And, and it was all like Connemara marble jewelry and just really nice. stunning connected pieces. And so I felt comfortable to say why I wanted to go to the well. I said, I really want to go to, at the time I had quite a few family members and coven members who needed healing. And she <laughs> said, she like puts her hand in her hip and leans on her desk. And she's like, just ask Bridget. She'll get you there. Wow. <laughs> and I was like, okay. So I go outside and I, I packed my lunch. So I'm having my lunch. And this crow lands right in front of me. And so I offered it half my lunch, like of, of the safe to eat stuff. I gave it some chips, gave it some bread and like a full half, like little by little. And then it finishes the last bite and makes eye contact with me. It's like the distance that we are now on the computer, like so close. Wow. And it flies. And then lowers itself over this man who was standing talking to somebody else and then flies back up again. So I look at the man and I just knew that was the message. So I go to this guy and said, hey, do you know how I could get to the Bridget's well? And he says, why do you need to go? And I said, because I want to send healing and ask for healing for some friends and family. And he goes, give me a second. He comes back out with keys. Turns out he works for the Cliffs of Moher. He's like, he's like, it's my lunch. It's pretty dead today. I'll take you. Wow. And he drove me himself. He wouldn't take any money. He was, he was a local. So he was telling me stories about it. And wow. it was so special. And, and it just felt so guided that Crow was the guide for that. Wow. And, and that story is really why we picked your book in about six seconds flat when we were looking through the catalog, because I was like, I need to connect more with Crow. Wow. Wow. Thank you for sharing that. That just gives me just the 
the warm chills. Uh, Me too. And, Even and, I tell it a lot, but it's just oh, it's just I, one and, of my favorite and, encounters. And that's that's been one of the blessings since my book came out. It books like I've mentioned to us before the you know before we started the interview. Uh, people share their crow encounters with me, and uh, I still just find it fascinating and and mind blowing. And um, and it's not just my pagan tribe and my uh, witches and Wiccans who are sharing these. It's just everyday quote unquote everyday people that have had these encounters. And and that's kind of the the theme of my book is if you if we allow ourselves to have this what I, I use the term communion with these animals yeah. it's going to make us word. more aware of the mysteries of nature whether you believe in god and goddess goddess energy or even just if you've come from a naturalist viewpoint and once you start observing crows and I, i'm sure with ravens too you won't see the world the same because you'll see these birds and it's like what are they up to? What are they up to? They're watching me as much as I'm watching them. And it's a reminder just of the beauty and mystery that we're blessed with, um, you know, living in this time, this place. So, yeah. So, yeah. Thank you for sharing that. That's just wow. And it makes I haven't been to Ireland since 2005. So I'm overdue to go back. So that's more inspiration uh, to visit there. So. Yeah, yeah. Well, tell our listeners how they can keep up with your your travels, your art as well, where they can find I, you on the internet. Yeah, I, I I do have my my website, rickdyampert.com. It's all one word. I uh, uh no spaces uh like in my name. I have to confess, I don't always, I'm not always the best at keeping my appearances and workshops uh, updated on my website. Uh, if people catch me on Facebook, they're welcome to, you know, send me a friend request on Facebook and because uh, I, that's a good way for me to stay connected. Uh, if you go to Mr. Crow Art, M I S T E R, Mr. is spelled out, Mr. Crow Art.com, you'll see my crow art. And again, my my art is is my way to palpably manifest the spiritual, supernatural aspect of these creatures. That's why I started doing it. Take photos. I don't use AI, I don't use Photoshop. But I shape shift them into phantasmagoric, psychedelic images, sometimes just black and white. But it's my way to express their supernatural, uh, cosmic, uh, special nature. And then one final website, uh, my girlfriend Michelle and I, we're a music duo. I play sitar and native flutes. She plays wow. bass. She plays bass and crystal bowls and tongue drums. So if you go to wandering, spiral.com w a n d e r i n g as in moving around wandering spiral.com you'll see our music side and some uh crow sample uh, crow samples uh <laughs> sound samples i think i just i just heard a crow on your end yeah yeah they um sometimes they i mean they they they'll come by every day so yeah they'll probably they wanted be to here. be in the interview <laughs> they did they did uh so yeah so um so anyway, there's there's the the shameless self promotions. Um, awesome. So, so thank you so much for having me on. This has been a, a big joy. A big absolutely big joy. for us as well. I'm really glad that your book is out there as well because it's not just for witches. It's not just for pagans. It's really it's all of it. It's the myth, the science, the magic of crows and yes. ravens. Yeah. Thank you so much. Merry meet. Mary part and, and Mary meet, meet again. again. Thank you for joining us on the Magic Kitchen podcast. Please visit my website, leandrawitchwood.com, for news, information, and more episodes. I'm Elise Wells, and I can be found at Seeking Numina on YouTube, Instagram, and Facebook, and seekingnumina.com. That's seeking, N U M I N A.